Welcome back everybody to another reaction video. So today we're going to be going back to Oversimplified. Now the very first reaction I did on this channel was an Oversimplified video, it was their video on the American Revolution, so I've not done anything from them since doing that, so this will be um, good to go back to this channel because I'm a huge fan of Oversimplified, I've loved pretty much everything that they've done, they're just a fantastic channel, so please go check them out. There'll be links to their channel and the original video in the description, because today we're taking a look at the First World War. Um, the First World War, I think, is an area that most people know sort of what's in the pop culture. They know, you know, the, the stereotypes, things like trench warfare and things like that, and the advent of tanks and, you know, over the top and things like that. They know pretty much what's in the pop culture. I know kind of um, around about the same level. I don't know a huge amount about World War One. I've known, I've picked up some things just from know osmosis of watching other content as well particularly through watching um vlogging through history which is the inspiration for me doing this in the first place so um go check out vlogging through history because um chris who runs that channel he's just done a recent tour of um some parts of europe um i think he was in france recently and um the netherlands as well i believe and he's done some original content on his channel where he's going around certain sites of the First World War, and it's um, extremely engaging stuff, so go check that out, and that kind of um, content is where I've just absorbed other knowledge about the First World War, so um, I thought it would be good to take a look at something um, on that topic. So, um, as always, before we start, if you like what I do, please leave a like, and also comment, comment something that you learned from the video, so something that you learned from my reaction, or something from the original video itself. Um, also, if you want to support the channel, please subscribe, make sure notifications are on. I have reaction content every Wednesday and Friday at 3pm GMT, so don't miss anything. And if you want to support the channel a bit more, there's also links to Patreon over in the description as well. I do have a target at the moment of £500 a month. When I get to that point, I'll be able to start dedicating more time to the channel. I'll be able to, because it will be more financially viable for me to do so, I'll be able to add uh, more perks to the Patreon tiers and things like that. I'll be able to do more content, more original content too. Um, and I'll be able to just make this more of a, a job than a hobby at the minute. So um, you'll get a lot more the more you support me. So please consider doing that as well. Um, but let's just dive straight in. So this is Oversimplified, The First World War. The world of 1914, a time of modern technology, culture, and fashion. Truly the height of civilization. <laughs> Let's have a war. Everyone knew a big war was coming. France wanted some stuff back that Germany had taken from it. Germany wanted to take more of everyone's stuff. That territory, just re really quickly, that territory, Alsace-Lorraine, that's been seesawing back and forth between France and Germany for centuries at this point. You know, it was a point of contention in like the Napoleonic Wars and even before that as well, um, because it's resource rich. And obviously resource rich areas you need to control if your country needs to get ahead. Um, but what he's referring to there was the Franco-Prussian War, which I believe was the 1870s, I think. Uh, I'm not too sure. I think that's roughly when it was. Um, which was where the Kingdom of Prussia basically unified this confederation of German states into the German Empire uh, that we have in this um, point in time here. So that's what that's referring to. And they were building a big sexy navy that was making the British uncomfortable. These two empires thought they were really cool, but lots of different people who lived there didn't think it was so cool. And some of them had even been declaring independence with help from Russia. Everyone was talking about each other behind each other's backs, throwing the fact that military technology had come a long way since the last major war, and suddenly everyone was pretty eager to beat each other up. In this area of Austria-Hungary lived some Serbs and Bosnians who hated living in Austria-Hungary. So the Austro-Hungarian Archduke Franz Ferdinand goes there for a nice drive in an open-top car with his car's route published in advance. And that went just about as well as you'd expect. Mm -hmm. Some assassins were waiting for him along the way and threw bombs at his car. But they missed and blew up some officers behind him instead. So the Archduke goes into hiding, leaves Sarajevo, and the whole war never happened. <laughs> Except no, the Archduke doesn't leave, but instead goes back out in the open top car to visit the injured officers in hospital. The driver takes a wrong turn, and by sheer coincidence gets stuck beside yep. one of the failed assassins, who shoots him. Austria-Hungary is understandably pissed. Now, one of the sort of tragedies about that as well is that, yes, the, the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was a multi-ethnic empire. 
There was different uh, nationalities living there, different linguistic heritages, all sorts of different cultural ties um, between these different regions. And um, the current emperor, which was Franz Ferdinand's grandfather, I believe, because his father had died before um, he became the heir, um, he was the last of sort of the old class. And Franz Ferdinand himself was kind of... Um, much more of a moderate, much more of a, a modernizer, you know, at least, you know, for the time. Um, you know, he kind of believed that the old ways had to come to an end, that, you know, that the empire had to become a bit more decentralized. You know, it, it, you know, he was more willing to sort of entertain the possibility of, you know, giving self-rule to a lot of these territories and making it more of a, a collaborative empire rather than um, a domineering one. And so the sort of ironic tragedy of that is that the Serbs assassinated the man most willing to be their friend, you know, in the empire to come. So, um, you know, it's just one of those kind of historical ironies there. Pissed about all this, and they think the Serbian government had something to do with it, which they might have. So they go uh, yeah. to their ally Germany Possibly. and say, hey Germany, we're going to declare war on Serbia, and Germany is all for that. So Austria-Hungary send a big list of impossible demands to Serbia, and when Serbia refuses... They refuse. There was, I think there was like ten demands. Serbia accepts like nine and a half. They accept most of them. You know, they, they accepted the, the vast majority on there. But that's what, you know, Austria-Hungary... Austria-Hungary? Austria... Austria-Hungary, Austria sorry. They knew exactly what they were doing by providing this list. You know, they knew that they weren't going to agree to all of them. And that's, you know what they would then use for a casus belli to say, well, look, you know, we've tried negotiating, but they're being recalcitrant, you know, they're being stubborn, they're not agreeing to our demands, they just assassinated our heir to the throne. You know, how could anyone sort of oppose this kind of thing? And um, that's es essentially what leads, you know, Austria-Hungary was um, pretty much gunning for a war at this point. They wanted to sort of, they wanted to invade and take this over. So, um, you know, it's just one of those, sort of um, factors of history, you know, m most empires did this through history, they would present demands that they knew were not going to be accepted, so they could use that as a pretext to invade. They declare war. Austria-Hungary and Germany are friends, and Serbia is protected by Russia, who's friends with France, so they'll declare war on each other. Montenegro joins in too. France and Britain also have a kind of alliance, so when France says, hey Britain, you got my back? Britain is like, Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just a quick point about that as well is that I think the big mistake that Germany makes in this in terms of its international diplomacy is by essentially giving Austria-Hungary a blank check and saying, do whatever you want and we'll support you no matter what happens. You know, if if German diplomacy had been at the level of someone like Otto von Bismarck, you know, who even predicted, you know, he was sort of the... the the statesman who unif helped to unify Germany in the Franco-Prussian War, he basically predicted this. He said that there will be another great war and it will start in the Balkans because the Balkans is like a powder keg. You know, it's just waiting to explode. If German diplomacy had been on his level, you know, they would have been much more... Um, they would have been much more wary about what they were doing. They would have been much more cautious and calculating about it. They wouldn't have just said, do whatever and we'll support you, because that's what drags Germany into the war. And then they decide to stay out of it, which is great for Germany, because Germany has a plan. They know that Russia is so big and clumsy that it will take them a while to get ready for war. So with this guy in charge, Germany will send all its troops into France at lightning speed while Russia's getting ready, Defeat France, then move all the troops to Russia, and defeat Russia, and then we all speak German and eat Pfeffer Potast every day. Just one problem. Didn't France work. has loads of forts and defenses along its German border, and Germany can't waste any time fighting them, so Germany decides to go around them. Through Belgium. Now, again, does this sound familiar? It's this exact same strategy that was used in World War II. Knock out France, then knock out Russia. Um, now... This line here, um, I don't know what it was called in the First World War, but in World War II it's called the Maginot Line, and it was extremely well fortified. You know, the Germans did not want to attack this in either war. So, but the point of the war wasn't to def sorry, the point of the line wasn't necessarily to defend this front. It was to make sure that the Germans would have to go through another way. Um, but 
they weren't necessarily counting on the fact that they would start invading neutral countries because Belgium was um, politically neutral and the guarantor of Belgium's neutrality was the UK. So France was kind of hoping that um, by building these heavy defences it would deter another German invasion because they were kind of banking on, well, you know, they're not going to invade neutral countries because that will put them on the back foot internationally in terms of international diplomacy. It will make them look like the bad guys. And also it will drag Britain into the war, which was the last thing that Germany wanted. Britain at this time was the most powerful nation on earth. It wasn't necessarily the most powerful nation in Europe, you know, as, as a continent, that was Germany. But in, globally, you know, Britain had a massive empire that it could rely on um, and, you know, marshal huge resources to defeat Germany. So, you know, that was kind of the, the idea behind this. But then Germany kind of stuns everybody by invading neutral Belgium, which then paints them as the villains in the war. Belgium is neutral, but Germany wants to march 750,000 troops through it to get around France's defences. They're hoping Belgium will just kind of sit down and shut up, but they don't. They fight back, and they're pretty good too, so they slow the Germans down. What's worse is that Britain shows up, and they're pretty pissed that Germany's invading neutral countries. So now Britain declares war on Germany. So Germany push on through Belgium and commit some atrocities along the way. They also wear spikes and sometimes skulls on their uniform. So if you're trying to not look like the bad guys, <laughs> good job. The Allies have a propaganda extravaganza, and this starts having an influence around the world, notably in America. The US President Woodrow Wilson sees himself as a bit of a Jesus figure, and spends mm. most of the war trying to get everyone to just hug it out. But there's also a large population of ethnic Germans living in the United States, and when the war first broke out, they were like, yay Germany. But now that they're committing atrocities in Belgium, they're less enthusiastic. Let's play Spot the French Soldier. <laughs> Did you see him? Easy, right? He's wearing a bright blue uniform with red trousers. And do you know who else spotted him easily too? The Germans. So when the French were slowly marching in columns through the countryside, the Germans easily tore them to shreds with their giant guns. All the nations involved in this war went in with an old school war mentality. Mm-hmm. And all of them had to update their uniforms and tactics a lot during the Great War. Because this war was going to be like nothing anyone had ever seen before. Russia's ready for war, and way earlier than expected. Yeah. Hey, Austria-Hungary, can you get... The, yeah, that's the other thing that Germany was not expecting, was that they didn't expect Russia to mobilize so quickly. Because like you said, Russia's a huge country, you know, and it's got a vast expanse of territory to cover to get its troops to the front line. They were not expecting them to mobilize so fast. So now, Germany has not only been dragged into the war by its own failed diplomacy, but it's now fighting a war on two fronts. And this is what's going to, you know, and it's also shot itself in the foot by invading neutral countries. Because had Belgium given Germany permission to march through, that would have been different because that would have been an agreement between the two countries. It wouldn't have been an invasion, uh, you know, in the traditional sense. You know, it would have been military access, essentially. Um, but they've also invaded neutral countries. They've dragged the world's premier superpower into the war as well. So, and they're also um, getting to the point where they're attracting the attention of the rising superpower, which is the United States. So, you know, they're kind of in in many ways they're kind of setting themselves up for failure right from the start. Get on top of that. Oh yeah, sure, we've got this. Nope. So Germany has to send some troops back to the east to defend against the Russians. The chief of staff of the Austro-Hungarian army is this guy, and although he is handsome, he turns out not to be the best military strategist. Austria-Hungary constantly ignores Germany's advice, and then comes running back to Germany whenever they get in trouble. Austria-Hungary even gets its ass kicked by tiny Serbia, who repels all their invasion attempts at the start of the war. It's better news for Germany in the north, though, where they almost completely wipe out the Russian second army. Back on the western front, the Germans continue advancing and are in sight of Paris. At this point, anyone would be forgiven for thinking the Germans were going to get that quick victory after all. But then things start to go wrong. The French commander-in-chief knew something had to be done, and he ordered his armies to stop retreating. In the resulting battle, a gap opened up in the German lines. If a gap opens up, the enemy can use it to flank you from the side and behind, so the German armies have to retreat. The Allies launch a counterattack, so the Germans dig into defensive positions. The Allies do the same. 
Then both sides move north, trying to outflank each other along the way. When they reach the sea, they're in a stalemate with trench systems running the whole way from the coast to Switzerland, the beginning of trench warfare on the Western Front. Here's how trench warfare works. Two opposing lines of trenches with no man's land in between. One side would pummel the other with hundreds of thousands of artillery shells, sometimes for days at a time. This had a huge psychological effect on the soldiers, leaving many shell-shocked. Then, the attacking troops would leave their trenches and rush across no man's land, a muddy wet mass of shell craters and barbed wire. The defending trench would unleash machine gun fire on the attackers, inflicting thousands of casualties. The attackers would send wave after wave until either they gave up or the opposing trench was finally overrun. There would be months of fighting and the deaths of thousands in order to gain a few meters or kilometers of land. Living in the trenches was hard work too. Corpses, mud that could swallow you whole, pools of poisonous water, rats, disease, the smell. It's insane that millions of soldiers put up with these conditions and commanders ordered them to do so for years. Mm, very true. But it's also um, worth pointing out that you know, there's this kind of stereotype that the First World War was just this kind of static war for the entirety of its duration, that it was just this massive war of attrition, and obviously that is, in part, true, it was a war of attrition, but also, um, you know, the idea of the senior command just being completely clueless and sending these human wave attacks one after the other without any consideration to strategy isn't entirely accurate. You know, it's um, there's certainly criticisms that can be levied. The Somme offensive is one, you know, the Somme offensive was launched purely because it's where the British and French lines met. It wasn't because it was strategically viable for to launch an offensive in that area. You know, that's just the reason that they chose that area to do that. Um, but, you know, there, there were many attempts that because of war and, you know, disastrous, you know, um, events like this, it breeds innovation. You know, necessity is the mother of invention, as they say. And they needed to break these trenches, so what do they do? They start innovating. You start getting things like gas attacks. You know, um, just a couple of years into the war, you start seeing things like tanks, you know, coming into the, the fray. You start seeing developments in how to coordinate artillery properly. You know, obviously, because of the industrial nature of the war, casualties were astronomically high. Um, but it wasn't the case that it was just this, you know, um, static conflict where, you know, neither side tried to innovate and just threw men at each other. You know, that's, um, no pun intended, that's an oversimplification. But um, I think we're nearly at the end, but let's just see if there's anything else that he has to say. Oh, no, I guess not. I guess that's the end. Um, so, yeah, as I say, Oversimplified is a fantastic channel. So um, I like that they kind of condense history into like these bite sized chunks while also being really entertaining in how they do it as well. You know, if anyone out there is a teacher watching um, this, Oversimplified would be a fantastic choice to show in class, you know, I would say because of, you know, the nature of how it's done. It's done in an entertaining sort of cartoon way, but it gets the information across. So uh, please go check them out. And as always, thank you so much for watching. I shall see you next time where we look at part two. So again, thanks for watching. I shall see you on the next one.